Hello and welcome to another installment of FIT Talks, the oral history program of the Fashion <laughs> Institute of Technology, which is one of 64 campuses of the State University of New York. I am Professor Karen Trivett, head of FIT Libraries Unit of Special Collections and College Archives, and it's this unit that administers the FIT Talks program. <laughs> We are coming to you today from the FIT campus, at least in part, um, on West 27th Street. Uh, we are in Manhattan, New York City, USA, and it is May 31st, 2022. And the time is currently 1.33 in the afternoon Eastern Daylight Time. I have the honor and privilege to be joined today by Professor Stephen Stippelman of the Fashion Design Art Department. Professor Stippelman, thank you so much for joining me today and welcome to the program. My pleasure. My pleasure. So we're just going to launch right into my questions. And the first is actually more of a question for you to make a statement, which is, if you will, please tell uh, listeners or viewers a little bit about your childhood. Well, my childhood, to quote my mother, you were the easiest child in the world. All I had to do was give you a piece of paper and a pencil and you disappeared. So it was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of a given. And um, I just remember drawing. I mean, there must've been this one little phase when I was five years old where I wanted to be a doctor, but that went away by five and a half. Okay. I hear you, yeah. <laughs> always be something in the arts. Very early, early, early on, maybe when I was 12, 13, um, I wanted to be an architect. And then I went for my Boy Scout merit badge in architecture and didn't get it because all the math was wrong. So I had to mix that one. <laughs> yeah, it was and I grew up, my mother, <clears throat> my mother um, initially wanted to be a millinery designer, but because of the depression, she went to Pratt, she had to drop out. Mm. And my grandfather, who I never knew, which was her father, was a jewelry designer and he did oh. all tempera plates and he actually made the settings, but I never knew him. So what happened when it began to be serious in junior high school, when my art teacher told my mother that she thinks I should go to music and art high school. Oh. And um, I was thrilled with it. And the shocking part was, it, it is just like really funny because I was always the best artist in my class and always the best artist in my school. Now we're talking about public school and junior high school. We're also talking about no one drew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my competition was not stamp. So <laughs> I went for my test in music and art. Um, God, I lived all the way in Brooklyn. It was down at the end of the map and the music and art was 135th Street by City College. I walk in and my mouth dropped open I was so taken aback. Oh. Everyone that was there for that interview drew well. Whoa. And it was many drew much better than me. Oh my God. It was, I said, oh my God, we're in the <laughs> world now. You know, and it was a grueling test. It was a grueling, grueling mm. test. We had a portfolio. We had to draw from a student model. We had to do a three dimensional thing. We had a huge interview. Um, I think I was there all afternoon. And when I left, I'll never forget it. On the way home, going to the subway, I was crying. Oh, gosh. Because I will never, ever be accepted. Oh, it must have been so intimidating. It was so intimidating. It was probably, probably the most intimidating thing that I ever had in my life. Wow. And then I got accepted. Ah. <laughs> I went there for three years. It was the most fabulous education of my life because oh, wow. you're 14. So 14, 15, 17, whatever. Yeah. Um, and it was the hardest work in my life mm. to attain a level. I had to kill myself. And I think that was, I mean, some of those kids were geniuses. They were geniuses. There was mm. no other work for it. And I did wind up, you know, with 97s and things like that in my art grade. So impressive. 
Akamisi. And I think that was the greatest experience of my life, having to really experience working for something. Right. I, granted. <clears throat> Just a, a stunning story. Um, I have to tell you, my first memory is at age two and a half, and it's documented in a photograph because um, photographs used to have the month and the day and the year in the border. And so I can pinpoint that month and, and year, and I was drawing. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's something that never lets you go. I think if it's what you really want to do, you have it for. It, you just have it. It's like yeah. singing or dancing, kids dance. Exactly. Exactly. The pencil or crayon or charcoal or something becomes part of your appendage. So when <laughs> I did music and art, um, we we kind of do majors kind of. Thing. Um, it was, I majored in, in, in fine art. So I did mostly paintings and um, etchings and we did all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would, the work was good. I mean, I have to say, for that level, I still had photographs of some of it. But then I took one fashion class, and her name was Mrs. Winston, and um, I loved it. Oh. I loved it. But I was so afraid to tell my painting teachers. <laughs> fashion class. <laughs> they had competition. Yeah, even to this day, fine art and fashion is like a friendly war. But, right, right. So I didn't know what to do. And they were shocked. How oh. do you go into fashion? Um, you're such a good painter. And I kind of blocked what they were saying because I couldn't I couldn't deal with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what happened is I think I wanted to be a fashion designer. Oh. And I think the first thing that came to my mind if I'm an illustrator, I'll draw. It's better than nothing. <laughs> right, right. It might be an entree. Uh, and they that was fine. And then from there, I went to FIT. And that's where I studied. Uh, that's just amazing. What was the, um, the admissions process like for you for FIT? Well, after the one in music, no admissions process would be anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was an interview. Mm -hmm. and the woman who interviewed me was my teacher, Mrs. Duan, and she was very elegant. I mean, she was, she was you know, you judge age by your parents, I guess. When sure. that, she was like, could have been my grandmother, basically. And she was this very statuesque woman with just a massive white hair. Oh, wow. She was wearing a brown velveteen top with a big pin on her shoulder and i am sitting there and saying please let she not be the one that interviews me well, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but oh it my gosh if we kind of interview because you know the one from high school what's your competition like i said you know so i draw so everybody else mm -hmm. is good in math you know mm -hmm. but coming from music and art to fit i the you know, I was a little bit more secure. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that, you know, I was more secure about my skill. Sure. And, well, you had developed so much yeah. too, I would think. And I got accepted and another funny thing happened. It's going to answer maybe something else here. And when I came here, I, had, I'm not going to say I had a little attitude, but I probably did. Okay. <laughs> and, um, we had, you see, it was easy for me. It was easier. I had mm -hmm. model drawing in high school. I, I had a very good background in my right. education of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, I'm, I was 17, not 14. But so it wasn't super new. So I had one teacher who was the most influential teacher I think ever. I adored her. Her name was Ruth McMurray. Oh. And she had round black glasses. Ooh. She wore a headband and had a full <laughs> ring. And I never saw anyone like her in my life. You know, and she was a big art director in advertising in the Mad Men period where women. Really? Wow. Had two daughters, Amanda and Sarah. I, this is my <laughs> and one of them was my age, one of them was my brother's age. And I used to just sit like this. <laughs> I think like class. 
because it was a class in layout design and I didn't really care about it. Oh, wow. Okay, so now we have a project. Uh huh. Um, like any student, no matter who you are, I didn't do it. And I waited. <laughs> so and, but she changed my life. And I, I was home in Brooklyn and I needed a blackboard and I didn't have one. And it's like 11 o'clock at night and it's due in the morning. Oh boy. But kind of temporary insanity hit in. I took tracing paper and painted <laughs> with Indian. Don't ask why. The whole thing buckled up. Oh now no. I'm ironing it to straighten it out. <laughs> I'm slapping the photograph on it. In my head, I'm thinking maybe she won't know, but I kind of didn't believe it. So I come in the next day and of course, I used to always do my work. It was maybe just this one time I did. And everyone had these really fancy projects. So I, mm. and my students do this now too. And I slipped it on the desk in the middle so it would not be visible. Oh. That was okay. And I knew she was going to take it home. Then we get it back. I'm getting a little nervous now. I get mine back. And all it said on it was, see me, please. Oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> After that, I adored this woman. And I went up to her. I was a little shaking. Oh. And I said, Mrs. McMurray, you want to see me? And all she did was look at me and say, with your talent, this will never happen again. Get oh. it? <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> life. And I wound up getting an A- in that class. She read oh, wow. She read me, and I think I teach, you have to be read every now and then because mm. I'm too comfortable. <laughs> right, and right. And if it doesn't call it, it's not good. Mm -hmm. Right. No, it's, it's, it's about how you answer a challenge or a test. Yeah, she was the greatest teacher. Wow. Um, so did you have to declare a major, and what was it? Fashion illustration major. Okay. Right, right. But How populate, oh, sorry, go ahead. But it had a second little part. It was called fashion illustration and advertising design. Oh, okay. We did layouts and stuff like that. That part mm -hmm. didn't me that much. But my two favorite teachers, her and Bill Ronan, who's the reason I came to FIT, oh. um, they both taught that class. And oh, I nice. worked with him on the yearbook and it was like a great experience. And um, I had a good time at FIT. It was not as stressful as my high school by any means. I have to say it wasn't, but it was more fun because everyone was kind of doing, everyone was in the same major as me. Mm -hmm. And it's, about how large was the student population at the time? Do you have a clue? It was the C building. Oh, just, oh, wow. Okay. School, the school, the bookstore, the gymnasium, the cafeteria, the graduation was in the backyard. There were no dorms. <laughs> they told, there was nothing in the neighborhood, like at, f at six o'clock black, total black. Mm. Fur, a fur neighborhood, fur and fur and fur linings and a right. little bit of leather. And they would tell us, go home right after school. Like, hey, there was nothing you could do. Mm -hmm. um, it was a tiny school. I, I mean, my this was my registration. I'm in section 101. Well, next term you're in 201. <laughs> <laughs> you're in 401. There, there was you go. No registration even. <laughs> my section and the other one. So right, right. It's interesting what what hasn't changed when I think about the programs at FIT now. <laughs> They're very structured most of them very structured and you know what you're going to experience for the next x number of years of your life as a student mm -hmm. it's much more look i mean teaching um, what students have to know now makes my school in the joke oh really i mean it, it's yeah you can't even compare my school into what they're it's every year we're stuffing something else into their head Mm -hmm. Now you have to know this. Oh, but you have to know this. But we don't take away. <laughs> right, right. So it's only addition and addition and addition again. And their workload is. Oh. They're all sparkly the first day and green the last day. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, we engage in my unit. We engage with students for internships. And to hear them discuss what is expected of them <laughs> gives us the chills.
Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing the amount and capacity they have to satisfy. For free. And they're not even getting paid. Well, right. Oh, boy. Harder than when I got my first job. Speaking of which, tell us about that first job after FIT. So my first job, it's interesting. I was the only illustrator in Henry Bendel, which was oh. a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous store on 57th Street. But leading up to that, you know, when you get out of school, I mean, there, you always think, my God, I'll never get a job, okay? Mm. Because every teacher says the profession is not the same as it was when they were in school. I don't say that. I just say it's different. Yeah. It's just different. It's not not the same. There will always be fashion. People need clothes. And that's the end of it. And clothes don't come out of the air. Right. So, so, you know, there were... So when I was in school, there was a breakfast. And for, they were looking for... Geraldine Stutz was the president. And she was an amazing, amazing woman. And um, they were looking for an unknown to do their work. And they chose four portfolios. Mine was one of them. We each got a chance to do an ad. Linda Tain, that will be later, modeled for me. Oh! And I was the one they rejected. Completely. What? So now I move on and, you know, devastated. But you don't know. You know, you think now that's over. Okay. So now I go to Saks for an interview. And the art director at Saks tells me, Henry Bidnell is looking for an illustrator. And I'm, I think it was just being naive and frightened. I didn't question anything. I'm just figuring, like, I just went through it. And you also think everyone in the world knows what happened to you. Like, I'm just out of school. Right. I was smart enough, or dumb enough, I don't know why, to just say, what's the art director's name? Ooh. And it was somebody else. <laughs> I made an I called up I got an appointment they gave me a trial and they hired me oh wow do you mind if I ask what year this is 1964 wow okay <laughs> talk about mad men period team oh my goodness or oh, wait my goodness. yeah wait no, 19, 19, 19. Wow. And so what was the scene like at Saks Fifth Avenue at that time? Well, Saks was a big store. Henry Rendell was a little store. So mm -hmm. Saks, it was too big a store. They weren't looking for new people. She wanted new and undiscovered. Like she discovered all these designers, like Jean Muir. She was the first one to bring Valentino to the to new. So she wanted new. And mm -hmm. I, I had... I was around the best clothes in the world. I mean, Norell, Gallant, Ben Zuckerman. I mean, all these clothes, and I would be um, just looking at them. And yeah. Look, and I would do all the ads for the Sunday Times and the Tribune. And I had a studio and a model. Wow! Right there in the in the flagship. I used to. It was only one store. Oh, okay. Very good. Yes. I used to use all my friends, so it gave them. Ah. Money. <laughs> They pay them. And then what happened, I always wanted to work at Women's Wear. That was everybody's dream job. That mm -hmm. was. So it's going to go back and forth a little bit. It'll come together. So when I was in school, I, of course, immediately wanted an interview there. And I had my portfolio and I met the art director, who was another very influential person in my life. His name was Rudy Millendorf. And could you repeat that? I'm sorry. It was a little low. U-D-I, Millendorf. Okay. I-L-L-E-N-D-O-R-F. And I go up with my portfolio. And this is something you want so much. It's like going for an audition for a movie. Yes. And he said, Stephen, I have to say something to you. And don't take it the wrong way. Oh, goodness. And it was okay. <laughs> I knew I'm not being hired, so what they're going to make. So we said... You're very, very talented, but it's a school portfolio. I want to see what you're about. Mm. And in a way, he was testing me. Mm -hmm. So he said, come back. 
how long would it take you for to come back with m new work? I said, two weeks. Okay. And I made an appointment right then and there. Wow. Came back. I think now it's okay. It's getting better. <laughs> what about coming back next month? Then he told me to look at the collections in Vogue and try to draw just as I would be doing there, like draw the Dior, draw the Norel, draw the Balenciaga. Okay. Well, I came back and um, that was the third interview. And Gosh. he said, okay, it's yours. And I got hired. And oh. um, I had my 20th birthday when I was there because I remember them getting me a cake and it was oh. 20. But there was a, a one part before this. So my, I had a little job while I, it was, it wasn't an internship. I don't even know what it was. It was in my senior year. And I guess, I don't know, we had a job bank. I, I can't remember it so long ago. And it said this company, Originala, which was a very high end coat and suit company, um, was looking for an illustrator. It didn't give any more detail than that. So it went up and I got the job because I had in my portfolio, I had very, I had a lot of coats and suits because I like to draw them. Mm. And so now I'm at that job for, I don't think, first of all, I don't think I was there two weeks. Okay. I'm at the job maybe 10 days oh. so, from lunch, but I love it. I watch all the tailors make the coats. and. Oh, wow. And what they did, they put me in a room. I had no idea what this job was. He brought in a Pierre Cardin coat, I remember it. And he said, just sketch versions of it. I mean, it's what we teach, we design it. Right. I didn't know what to do. So I figured longer, shorter, looser, different color, and I did it. So I come back one day from lunch and um, there's a note on my desk that Mr. Bader wants to see you. And it was owned by two brothers the Beta brothers, and they were very elegant men. And I think one of them I once read was a relative of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, wow. Oh. Anyway, so a very elegant man. So this is where the thing gets a little more distorted. Mm. Drawing this on his desk, and he had a beautiful office. And he looks at me, at me and I was clueless what was going on here. And he's going like this over my drawing, and he said, what's all this dirt? So I'm looking for smudges. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, oh, I can erase that, but I'm not even seeing any. And then I said, I don't know what you mean by dirt. And he said this, I said, your hand is going over my drawing. And he said, well, kind of, yeah. And he fired me. Oh, no. Oh. Goodness. Oh, the good part. Yes. And this made me, this a lot of what, this made the understood fashion people. Okay. Now I'm at Women's Wear, oh, maybe two years, a year and a half. And the art director knew I worked there. So he comes up to me and says, Stephen, we're doing a cover, page one cover of an original coat. Go sketch it. And he, oh. and he goes, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> story. Well, now I go up and this, you know, incidences like Mrs. McMurray read me about my work. This one made me really understand. I'm not going to say what fashion people are about, what business people are about, because okay. I worked in other professions except teaching. Um, so I come and I open the door. He's it was beautiful showroom. With gold. It was gorgeous. So he's sitting there with two buyers and it must have been Neiman's or Burgos, that's where the coats sold. The coats were $250 when coats were $59, okay? Oh my goodness, yeah. They were the price point under Norel and Ben Zuckerman. Okay, mm -hmm. I opened the drawer and this is what he goes. He goes, Stephen, it's so nice to see you. Now, dead face, because now I'm very secure. He needs me. <laughs> and I said, it's nice to see you too. And he literally turns to those women and says, he worked for us. 
we knew what a genius he was then. I, oh. didn't, I did not say a word, <laughs> but it was wow. the best education I ever got in that one sentence. Oh my God. Join this jerk. Now that people know my work, I'm a genius. Okay. <laughs> in a world, it might make sense. So I had a little pad like this, very, uh -huh. very like five by seven. And it was the days of those cookie cutter coats. You didn't need to see it on a body. It looked mm -hmm. So I just went like, um, can I draw number 207 what it is? And he goes, oh, would you like to see it on a model? I said, no, just hang it up. <laughs> I took the pad and I'm, I closed it. And he said, it was just a sketch for me. I was going to redo when I, you know, when I got right. back. And he said, could we see it? And I said, tomorrow you'll see it in the paper with everyone else. Goodbye. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Full circle. Exactly. Oh, my word. <laughs> so was this company part of the garment district? Yeah, but it was very high end. It was. Mm. We There was a coat and suit market then. which Right. Was, so you always had Norel and Trigere, and then you might have, then later, you know, then you had Bill Blass and Oscar Durante. Then it separated, and there was a building 512, mm -hmm. and, and that was all coat and suit. And you had Ben Zuckerman, Monsanto, and Cruzano, but you had original yes. Seymour Fox, dozens of them. But these were high end coats, oh. you know, like really high end. It doesn't exist anymore. Then you had 512, 498, 7th Avenue which was all cocktail dresses and even oh, wow. it was so easy in a way to find work because mm. it was look at the directory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it was there and you can get 10,000 interviews and like, um, and you got interviews, which. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now. That's the first get is to, to have the, the interface. The ones where for, I'm at FIT a drop longer basically only had two jobs. I was a woman who were maybe 24 years. Oh, wow. Tell and us, they, tell us ab about that experience. Well, they fired the whole art department one, one day. That was what happened. Oh my gosh. They were just going off photographs, but it was wonderful because I, I have a very good knowledge of fashion history and mm. I also learned how to make clothes when I was 12 or 13, because my mother was a fantastic seamstress. So, mm. So I would, we never saw clothes, you know, cause it was always in advance. The collection is tomorrow. So we would go up to the designers and I'd go up with another two wonderful women, June Weir, who she went on to be fashion of the times and, and millions. Of, and another tiny little woman who was like, could have been my grandmother easily. Her name was Tibby Taylor. She was tiny. <laughs> <laughs> but I call her. And, she would go to Rudy and she was like a tiny Tara. And she would say, I want Stephen all day Friday. And I would go to the market with her and I adored her. We oh. All these fabulous places. And she knew everyone from, she was working from the forties, you know? Oh yeah. In the sixties, she was probably 65, oh. you know, in the late sixties. So it was wonderful. And I would, draw from a designer sketch. I would draw from when Princess Carolyn got married. This I very rarely did I ever see a clothes. When Princess Carolyn got married the second time, we had a, a phone conversation with the House of Dior with Mark Bowen. And they were just oh. describing the dress. I sketched it. It was 100% right. Because we learned how to do it. The first one I ever did was Linda Bird Johnson's wedding dress. Oh, really? And what you have to do is, well, maybe a little more difficult now. You have to keep look, going back and looking at photographs. Mm -hmm. And you go, she always wears this. She always wears this. She always, she never wears this. She right. never wears ruffles. She never wears strapless. And we kind of extract all of that. Mm -hmm. She likes collar bands and she likes dresses of that shape. Mm -hmm. And last year or two, she was wearing a lot of Jeffrey Bean. Oh. So then we went back and looked at all the Jeffrey Beans. So we tried a sketch and it was a disaster wrong. It was all wrong. Oh. And John Fairchild knew how to get around all this. He was the owner. He mm. said, oh, you know, these Texans, they're always changing their mind. 
<laughs> now, editor's got a piece of the fabric from somebody gave it to her from the design room. But you didn't need the fabric. It was white Duchess satin. It didn't do any good to see it. Right. And they said it's going to be a copy of a Jeffrey Bean dress she wore in the last month. We found the dress. It was gray flannel with rhinestone bands. Oh. And this could be the dress. I drew it, it was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then during the, it was an amazing, my professional experience, I'm, you know, extremely grateful. Mm to have had. Then, like during the Reagan years and the Princess Diane year, Diana years, I would go up to the designers, and that's how I knew them a little bit. Um, and we had to draw what the ladies were going to be wearing. But mm -hmm. many clothes were made. So, um, like Adolfo was one I remember. He was one of the nicest, nicest people in the whole world. So I'd go up there. He'd take me back into the room. There'd be a black um, surplus blouse with a v-neck and a dolman sleeve. And he's going, Mrs. Bloomingdale is getting this in copper lame down to the floor with a slit. Deeper. Meanwhile, what am I looking at the blouse for? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this blouse. But yeah, it, you know, it was unconsciously we had photographs of these women every day. It's like you knew what they wore. Mm -hmm. Now you know Carolina Herrera wears white shirts with, with you right, know. right. But it wasn't okay. So I knew how to do it. Then I'd go back, but meanwhile, it was Mrs. Bloomingdale, Nan Captain, there was a million of them, never seeing the dress. Then I would go back, and they'd have all the photographs of them ready for me, and I would do portraits of them in the dress. And it looked, it appeared to the world that I was at every one of these parties. And oh. I, I never was, <laughs> you know. And my first big feature there was big one. I was living at home. It was when I first started. The art director comes over to me. He was so great. I loved him. And he goes, oh, Stephen, um, you're going to do a portrait tomorrow of Jackie. She went to Italy. It was kind of when she was kind of coming back out. Right. Or and she, she went to Italy and she bought all these things from Valentino. And he gives me a, a sketch. It was a maxi coat, black with fur trim at the bottom. Oh, ma. And he says, um, that's going to be the cover. And it has to be a portrait of her. And I was so. Then he goes, here are the other six for the inside. Oh. <laughs> I didn't go home that night. Oh. I was there the entire night doing it. Oh my goodness. And I did it. Like Just I amazing. Well, her from any angle, like without a photograph. But but um it was it was fabulous. And I went oh. a lot of time. It was fabulous. What can I say? It was a dream job and I was mm -hmm. I was really fortunate. I have no regrets <laughs> whatsoever. Truly. But I started to teach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so now I just graduated from FIT a year, maybe two, three years ago. And Mr. Ronan, Bill Ronan, who was now the chair of the department, and he was my other influential teacher. I worked with him on the yearbook a lot. Mm. I the yearbook. He calls me one night and he goes, Stephen, I have to ask you a favor. He said, one of the teachers had a car accident in Greece. Ooh. You teaching model drawing, could you teach the class? And I went, no. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody that gets hired in our department, this was their first experience. <laughs> and I said, I can't do that. This is ridiculous. And he goes, please, you have to do it for me. So I said, okay. <laughs> when in another sentence, he told me, I think that's one of the questions you had here about somebody saying something. Yes. Back on my life. First of all, I adored him. These were Aww. two. I totally respected him, everything. And um, he, I said, what do I do when I go in? <laughs> I mean, I knew the model poses. That's not what I was talking about. He said, listen to me. This is what you do. You do what you wish your teachers did but didn't. Whoa. 
never forgot that in my life. <laughs> what a void that yeah. feels in your mental space. And all of a sudden it became, oh my God. And he laughed after he said it. <laughs> and um, I said, oh, wow. I just remember saying, it took me a while to get it, you know? Yeah. And I was young. I maybe was 20, 21. So I go into the class the first night. It was a model drawing class, so it was a little bit easier because it was not a formal lesson. Mm. Model came in and we drew. Anyway, I'm standing around in the class with the class. And I look like your students. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't too much older. It, wasn't, it was an evening class, you know, maybe the same age. Right, right. Yeah, so I just said, okay. Okay, everybody, I'm the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I told them my name and they were familiar with some of my work, thank God. So the class is going on and just before I went in, Mr. Ronan, and this is my last time I started, Mr. Ronan tells me, now that you're gonna do it, <laughs> <laughs> be one woman in the class a lot older, like a lot older. Well, so much older than her son was 40, okay? Oh boy. And he said her name is Celia. And just be okay with her. Oh she boy. Have fun. So she sat in the corner, her name was Celia Teitelbaum. I, I bought Blonte's hair, so many rings. She had no talent whatsoever, <laughs> quite it. Okay, so now I'm doing the class and all of a sudden her hand goes up. And she goes, sweetheart, I have a question to ask you. I'm dying. Now, mm -hmm. me, sweetheart. It's like, uh, no, so I, I didn't know what to do. So I answered the question and then I said, I got to talk to her. So I said, can I just talk to you a minute? But it's like, talk, you know, she's an elder. It's like, <laughs> I said, please. I said, you can call me Stephen. Don't call me sweetheart in the class. And she goes like this, but you're so cute. I said, no, <laughs> I am not cute. I'm not sweet and don't call me sweetheart. And it was, she was a nice woman and she, she never, I mean, I had her another term. So. And then I, I taught FIT a little bit. I had some of my own sketch classes and that was it. I stopped for about a year or two. Mm -hmm. And when I was working at Women's Wear, one of the artists was leaving, got, she got married, and she was teaching at Parsons. And it was much easier then, and well, you know, but I had, my name was known. And mm -hmm. class. so I taught model drawing at Parsons basically for 20 years before I came here. But it part was, I was a woman's room, it was right across the street. Okay, yeah. And it was always the same class on like FIT, you know, it was Wednesday, nine to 11. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, I, the, the, the department closed up, it went through a lot of changes and then everything turned the other way. And then we all got fired from Women's Run one day, the entire art department. Oh gosh. And all of a sudden, back to level one, it's now 1964, but it's 1994. Okay. Oh my goodness. Oh. It's like, what am I gonna do? Uh huh. <laughs> doesn't exist, but thank God, I taught all these years. Right. So I got a job, and that's gonna answer another question about the person that influenced me again. And I got a job, I answered an ad. It was in Women's World, it was an ad that was a little ad with no company. And it was awful. And I was in my parents' house that day and I told my mother, Ooh, this is a little ad, I could really answer it, but I'm not going to. Ooh. I said, I just can't do that. <laughs> Put the resume in an envelope and send it. <laughs> <laughs> Questionable. No, she said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> you don't know, you know, but it was depressing. Okay, anyway, I sent it. The woman called me. She knew my work. Um, it was a design assistant job and I designed prints and stuff. And that's gonna lead into FIT and then I'll answer your question. And then 
it was a nice experience. It was a oh, experience. yeah. Um, we, they, I set up my resume to FIJ. I never heard from them. Oh. So this guy comes up. His name was Jimmy Newcomer. And he was a, a, a professor in the apparel department. And he was doing a practicum. And he was nice, very friendly. So I friends and went out to lunch. And I said, you know, I'm really upset. I said, I sent my resume to FIT. And they don't even respond oh. with all the years of teaching. And he goes, who did you send it to? Well, the person I sent it to, I don't think I sent it to anyone. I think I sent it to the department. Right, right, right. So there was another professor. We had Diane Demers, and I kind of knew her. She took a class with my life. So he said, Diana is the assistant chair. Send it to her. Okay. She gets the resume. This is where I kind of believe your, your life is kind of, I just believe it, that it's, you just have to do it, but you can't just sit back. Okay. Right. No. So Diane takes the resume and she goes to Linda Tang, who I knew from school. Yes. <laughs> Linda, you're Stephen's friend. Call him. Okay. I had lost touch with Linda for a couple of years. You know, the years we always touch. And it was like a weird time to be home. It was like 1130 in the morning or something. She calls me minute before I said, Linda, I said, I'm holding your resume. She's very funny. You know her. And I said, yeah. I'm holding your resume. And I think you qualify. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they said, well, let's come down for an interview. And she said, but I want to make you as the last one. So I came down and I got hired. And um, two teachers here did not want me in the worst way. In oh, their no. And who cares about that? That was just, it didn't matter. I got hired and, um, and Linda was, um, basically the one that guided me completely through the, through the teaching here. She was very known throughout the school. I mean, I mean, no, mm. <laughs> yeah, more retirement parties than one person ever had. Gosh. With our school was invited, the department, the union. It was just, you would have thought, God knows, that she was the president. And um, <laughs> probably could have been. And <laughs> she guided me through the everything, everything. Um, wow. And then I ran for full time and I got it. And, she, you know, I was going to meetings. It was a new part now that I wasn't quite used to. Mm hmm I remember advice she gave me where I used to, I, would, I just knew I'd go, oh, I can't stand that person. How could I go to a meeting with them? <laughs> and look at me and she'd say, you're not inviting them to dinner and you're not going out with them and you go and act professional. <laughs> 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 so, so oh. Every time I was like that, she reinforced it. And I was right. like, do it. And, you know, I just became a full professor and I was assistant chair of the department. I Gosh. was what TMP. I was chair of everything. But it was she guided me through the whole process and how I met her. Mm. We lived near each other. Oh um, I lived one subway stop before her. So oh, she gosh. first semester. And I was third. So we'd meet on the train. Okay. So and I was very friendly with her class. I liked her class a lot. Mm. So I had this teacher, Mrs. Marx, who, who <laughs> would always call me Eve, and I would tell her not to, and she wouldn't. And oh. I did a drawing, and I have the drawing, and she did a critique, but it was so negative. Was, oh. Like, um, luckily, I hate to say this, but I had seen the way she drew, so I took it lightly. Mm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, like the doll, this looks like this, there's no one in illustration should be. Okay, we get to this. Now I'm in the snack bar, <laughs> running over to me. So now I'm third semester, she's a freshman, and with a portfolio, and she's, and I knew her. So she goes, could you look at my work? I said, it's gorgeous. I mean, her work's beautiful. Pulls out a midterm warning from that same teacher. What? 
Did that teach about a hundred or what? Wrong, wrong, wrong. Oh and my goodness. That's how long I know her. So I know her actually as of today, almost 60 years. Amazing. Oh, that's just incredible. And, and to think about how many people you've encountered over the years, over the decades, what are some other names that stand out in terms of influence for you? Well, she's influenced. She's influenced as a peer. You know, we're the same. Mm -hmm. uh, those two teachers. Um, my mother, when I went to music in my high school. Oh, boy. Far, and it was really far. It was, I'd leave at six in the morning and come home seven at night. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And you're full liberal arts and then you had three hours of your art or music mm. all my mother said to me she said you better be serious about this <laughs> <laughs> well you you didn't have a choice that sounded like a big trip i'm nervous about it mm -hmm. and i looked at her and i i didn't even know what she was talking about because i was <laughs> curious about it yeah yeah very supported by my parents to oh do. good because i think my mother wanted a version of this sure yeah you know so interesting um opposite he has a master's degree in math and the minute we had fractions math was over for me yeah. <laughs> but that's the story of how i got to fit and i'm actually here now close to 25 years more 1993 i came okay yeah oh, 30. So when, when did that full-time status begin? 1997. Okay. That was my, a pretty quick turnaround. My tenure in 2000. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um, a little left of that. How has that trajectory been over all those years? I um, love it. Yeah. I actually, I think because the professionally, see, because when I started to teach at FIT, kind of, that the profession that I had known up to that point disappeared. So mm -hmm. like you're making Model T Fords. I don't know, it doesn't exist anymore. So I was able to approach FIT clean, mm -hmm. you know, scattered. And I always loved teaching. I loved it. And um, I still, I think if you asked me which part of my life I liked more, it would take me a while to answer it. Oh, wow. Because I guess you have to have, well, first there's the talent and then there's the exhibition of the talent in a certain way. And then it's sharing the talent. It's sharing the talent because I have friends who, who I a million times to come up for an interview. Oh no. I could not face 25 people. I mean, I guess it's intimidating, one against 20. Well, yeah. uh -huh. You know, and and what am I supposed to tell them everything I know? Mm -hmm. But it's every, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> it doesn't end, but I. it's so rewarding because you have two parts. The students, you know, you hear teachers say, it's like you teach, when I was a student, they say, uh, there's no more fashion profession. Okay, that's not true. Then you hear a lot of teachers who were here a long time, longer than even. You know, students are very different now. They're not the same. They're not the same, but they are not less talented. Right. <laughs> and there's a thrill. It's almost like a high when you get out of the class, but oh. it's many different levels because forget the superstar but that's still a high because mm. you 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 know you get the opportunity to work with them and bring them up so refined and so refined and so refined but it's just as rewarding to get the c student or the c minus student mm. i've gotten and bring them to a b minus oh yeah it's the same reward you know in fact it's a great challenge. I was going to say the struggle is much greater, at least from the student's perspective, but I guess on the professor's perspective as well. So also, I mean, what, what I like to do 
I teaching comes natural to me. I'm not afraid of any of it because I know it. So if I don't know something, I don't know it. I'll tell them, let me find out. There are a lot of things back. But you know, but I'm I come on, I'd have to be certain secure. I mean, this is like um but if I don't know something, um I said, don't worry about it. I'll I think uh Liz, but let me check. But I you have to go into a classroom, especially in a creative subject even in a foundation level where you are learning much more factual stuff, mm-hmm. you still have to approach every single person as separate. Oh. After the lesson, which is just a lesson, and mm-hmm. you, what, the way we, what we're gonna go about doing, you have to be able to jump into their head. They do not have to, and I once told that to a teacher, they don't have to jump into your head. Wow. You have to jump into their head. I said, not what you're doing, because I heard it here. And it was, I was, I said, you can't do this. Make it this way, fix it this way. I said, you discuss. You have to discuss it with them. Right. What do you think about it? Find something nice. There's always something nice. I mean, mm-hmm. you know what it is, but, um, and you and I said, you know, you have to get in their head. And she goes, but what if it's not my taste? I said, divorce it. <laughs> that, Ooh, yes. I said, when you go into their head, it's not about your taste. Right. Your taste is home. Mm-hmm. And you have to go from minimal to ruffles to 10 patterns to all solid black and <laughs> jump into where they're coming from and Gosh. them up. That's right. about I had never thought about how preference and taste and um, tendency might enter into the pedagogical experience in a in a department like yours. Well, in a lot of cases, it's not positive. <laughs> but I don't. I wouldn't even go in a department like mine in a lot of mm. subjects. I am sure many faculty don't do that, don't enter it that way. It's right. Not, since it's not about a school. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cool. But, but being here and my, I have friends here, there's groups of us that we constantly discuss things. Like, oh, well, you're doing it this way. Great. I think I'll try it that way. But and maybe I'll let it. And we're constantly evolving and evolving. And Linda and I have hours of discussion. Hours, <laughs> hours. So, what are you going to do here? And then, how are you going to go about that? She's a brilliant teacher. Um, it's, it's. You have to be open to change because fashion changes. Mm-hmm. You can never say, and this goes back to Mr. Rona. Do what you wish your teachers didn't do. And my teachers here all were kind of living in the 1950s when. Mm the world was wearing mini skirts and kind of not acknowledging it. And I don't know, I can't think back, like not really putting it down, but it just, they, I never felt that they were like there. Yeah. And they were, all, they weren't older. Some of my teachers, well, I had a baby teacher. She was like not even 30, but, <laughs> but um, you, you, you have to get into their head. And I make it very clear because we have a lot of discussions in class. I usually take the first half hour mm. to talk about things. What, you, what about that collection or things? Nothing to do with what the class is going to be about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fashion show will analyze it. Um, yeah. Uh, and I tell them what my taste is. I said, but that's my taste. That's So if I do a project, that's what it'll look like. But if I look at your work, my taste does not come in with it. I get into your head. And as a result, the, Linda has that same relationship and some of the other faculty here too. When they trust you, that's all you need. Oh. And I've had some difficult ones like this last semester, oh. an email. This is one of those fabulous stories. I mean, a, a student, very difficult. I knew the minute I walked in because I could see it right. Um, that the, she's going to be trouble. And the project was a mess. Mm. And she came to my office hour and it was more of a mess. But I was seeing how frustrated she got. 
So now I'm going like, well, forget about the mess. We've got to get her calm. Okay. Yeah. Hard to do. And I was getting very frustrated. And she writes me an email. It has a nice end. She writes an email to me saying, I find it impossible to work with you. Oh. I don't like your attitude. And almost like, unless you change it, I won't be able to work with you. Okay, I read it. I got a little angry. Then I said, oh. this is completely nuts. So let me like, <laughs> get over it. So I just turned it. And I said, my attitude was based on my being frustrated by you, mm -hmm. liking you, or not wanting to work with you. Mm -hmm. so this is what we do from now on. We begin tomorrow. Clean. Beautiful. She wanted to be getting an A in my class. Amazing. The best. But you have to understand, of course you want to go like this to them. But, <laughs> but it's not about that because sometimes not when they get that kind of frustrated, it's when, when that, it's frustration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It depends who were their teachers before you. She had easy teachers. Oh. I don't think that's good. No. Not an easy teacher, meaning you work. <laughs> yes. I'll give the whole class an A. I don't care about the grades about that, but you have to work for it. Okay. Right. The adjustment to me was too much, but once we, I said, you come to my office hour on Wednesday, I don't know when. And I said, the minute you walk in, it's the first time. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's very I, generous. And I think very fruitful what for, was the, for a good outcome. I'm going to fight this nonsense with her for a whole semester. Right. She, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. and, and, but that's what I love. Uh, I love getting... I love it. It's it's a tremendous high. I could I could go into a classroom like tired and just <laughs> crawl in. And then after the class is over, it's like such a high. You know? Oh. And you, you it, to say that after, you know, so many years is such a gift. And so, you know, exposing them like our students generally were not from a time where they do research from a book. Mm -hmm. But when we have certain projects, it has to be from a book. Mm -hmm. And then they could they could go online and do everything, but okay. But I bring the books in and sometimes when, because I have a lot of, when I watch them look at the books and it's like, it's like fascinated. Mm -hmm. I'm very into it. And then, like last semester, somebody, um, I don't know, she did some designs and she said uh, the influence came from a 1964 Valentino Couture. And it did. <laughs> it did. And I said, how do you, how did you know this? And she said, remember when you sent me something to look up? <laughs> While I was looking it up, I passed this. Oh, yes. A little well, serendipity goes a long way. Out, oh, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I wanted just to ask, to go back, um, as a faculty member at FIT, what can you say or comment on in terms of how being part of that community from that vantage point, how's that been for you? Because you've been here for such a nice lengthy time. I'd rather be in a classroom. <laughs> oh, I hear you. <laughs> no, it's, it's again, it's like, well, you know, in a classroom, it's a very different dynamic because mm. you're in charge. Mm -hmm. Your coworkers, you're not in charge. I mean, if when I was assistant chair, I'm not in charge. I'm just running the show, but I'm not telling you what to do. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You get the egos and you get the stubborn, but very, not a lot, but you get that in everything. It's not mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. and I find that in our area, we have fabulous communication. Absolutely. And, and especially as time goes on with faculty, new faculty keeps coming in and we, 
the people, like from my time and whatever, women, we kind of guide them so all the, we kind of guide them in a way where the friction can't even happen. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, I would say the faculty that I work with in the second half of my time here were very different than the first because the first time they were here 30 years and i was mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh it's so did the reverse <laughs> right and the dynamics changed a little bit but i i don't as long as you ego is the i think one of the most if i was going to change a profession i would i i mean we're like not i mean i would have been a psychologist and my my PhD would have been on egos. Oh, wow. Because I find it fascinating. Well, it, it can be it, the only driver sometimes, you know, in terms of decision making and. Yeah. And usually the ones with the real, real, real credentials have the least of it. Mm. I mean, they, there's a prima donna-ness you can, you can have when you're, uh, I mean, a designer for 40 years and you've won every award. Sure. That has nothing. To, that's a fact. Mm -hmm. An ego. I mean, I don't get it. That's the, it's like a thing. But it, yeah, no, I, I think, I think it is fascinating because you never know how one's own ego will be manifested, mm. how you react to it. Uh, so yeah, it's fascinating. But it, um, the more I am involved with this and, the larger the scope of people I become involved with, mm -hmm. you kind of get better at it. Don't you just better at it? Of course. Um, so speaking of all the people you've met, do any names stand out that just struck awe? In my professional life? Yes, sir. Um, one thing that I realized early on was that and I think it was that original story when he called me a genius. Mm. He called my work gar dirt. Um, mm. I never, all my friends were, uh, how do you work? So like more a uh, horizontal, they were people I work with. Mm -hmm. I never was super friends with people I work for. Okay. And I never, that story was so, that whole thing with that original thing. Mm -hmm. Of course they're gonna like my drawings. It's their clothes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> what, what Indeed. Is, but I, you know, it, it's, I think, it, I, I don't think I ever got taken by that. Mm -hmm. Or did I enjoy it? I loved it, I love meeting all these people. I met every designer. I I met Chanel. I mean, I met some Rock. Not that they, but again, are my friends with them? No. <laughs> did I meet them? Yes. How did I meet them? Because there was a work situation where I was with them for 10 minutes. So I thought, you know what I'm saying? Yes. So, yes. My friends, but um, I, there were a lot of designers whose work I respected a lot. And um, I never met Norell. Hmm. I met Galanos many, many, many times. Oh, wow. The, the thing with Galanos was very interesting because I was just like, a genius. And when I met him the first time, oh, God, it was, it was in the 60s, um, they, June Weir, who was a fashion editor, said to me, um, I want to, you know, something I can't believe how lucky, you know, and great. <laughs> she said, I want you to come up to the plaza with me this afternoon. We're going to interview Dallin Elsa and you'll sketch. And I'm standing there thinking, God, I'm like, oh. I never expected this in my life, right? Oh. <laughs> I, I, instead, yeah, I loved it. It was just, it was just so, a gift, like a, you know. Of course, yes. So I went up, and of course, I was nervous wreck. Mm. And he was very nice. He was a little, you know, a little pretentious, but but that you could be. I mean, but yeah, very sweet, very very nice. And um, I sketched a lot of stuff. It was a preview. Maybe I did ten drawings. It was a page one, inside two pages, 
And then I got invited to the show, and it was probably one of the most memorable shows I've ever seen. Oh, wow. So at the end of it, that day of the interview, I went to June. I said, I'm going to send him a thank you note, telling him um, that it was really a great experience. And it, it was. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. 23 years old here. So <laughs> address, you know, in California. And I wrote him, and I, and I said, I really want to thank you for this day. Um, and I did a drawing of him, but it was just a quick pencil drawing of him. He wasn't hard to draw. And I wrote it on the bottom. The note was written on the bottom. It said, thank you for a wonderful experience. Okay. To, just before COVID, there was a big Galano show at um, Drexel. Yes. So I was there with some people, and one of them said, your drawing was there. And I'm what? <laughs> it can't, what, it's not, can't. So I go over, it is my drawing. It was that note. What? It was framed in the show. <laughs> that had to have been so thrilling. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. So he was like one of them. There was another designer named Charles Kleibacher who was, um, he was a good friend of mine. Very oh good. yeah. I went up to draw one of his garments and stayed the whole afternoon. And I was friends with him forever. Oh, wonderful. Kenneth Paul Block, who was the reason I ever wanted to be a fashion illustrator. <laughs> I actually worked with him. It took me a long time to imagine I'm sitting in the same room. With oh. Him. He had to be to me the greatest fashion illustrator that ever lived. I, I'm oh my goodness. Total statement. Um. <laughs> Um, to watch him work was just, yeah. So you where I could just see him. <laughs> look like this, look. Oh, it's, please. Oh, effortless, seemingly the, effortless. Boy, you die, you know. Oh, my goodness. I mean, so, they, oh, sorry, go ahead. Those were, I had some the teachers here, ones were the, the fat art director two senior fashion editors that I used to go with all the time. Mm -hmm. Those and stuff. There have been, look, I, people I work with are, have made a difference in my life. Yeah. You know, I mean, Linda's my oldest friend and I don't put her in that kind of category. Right. But um, there were some fabulous teachers that I used to work with here in apparel. Mm -hmm. It, it, it is not the one. I think when you say the one person or those kind of thing, I think it often has to go back to when you're younger. Mm -hmm. Not happened too much to my age now. <laughs> <laughs> Although, <laughs> a student once told me, um, to, he once said to me, just before COVID, but, um, he said, God, you're the youngest thinking teacher we have in this department. <laughs> That's was, great. So open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, that tells me you're a risk taker. You embrace taking risks. Otherwise, what's the point? Look, you go into a classroom, seriously, you're teaching the creative subject. It also depends, like when you're in first semester, second, you're teaching a lot of foundational stuff. So it's a little different. I used to teach a lot of that. I don't really now. Now I like working more with the seniors and juniors because um, it's more one-on-one. -on -one. But um, you, you have a syllabus. You have a lesson. You walk in the classroom. The minute you walk in the classroom, both are going to change. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A good teacher, and those are the ones that I have the most respect for in the world, mm -hmm. could turn it on a dime. The ones who I, I don't put in that category are the ones who go in and spit it out and go to the next class and spit it out. And the third yeah. one, uh, 10 years later, they're still spitting it out. Oh. But one question could change the dynamic of that lesson. Truly. One question. Absolutely, yeah. And I find it very easy to go off and then come back. So, mm -hmm. and then if you go off, like if you ask me a question and I mean, 
I tell my class, ask me questions while we're doing it, but not ridiculous. Like if we're drawing lace, don't ask me how to draw fur. But if it's about, <laughs> you know, yeah. one thing, especially in drawing where they'll go, but what if? And then all of a sudden, oh, but you know, wait, figure out what I just did. You can also do this. And then you that's to me the joy of teaching. And mm-hmm. that I never see it as a job. I never saw anything in my life as a job. That that's a gift for sure. I just want to ask you another couple of questions and because we're almost at time. Um, um so what is there left to be done for you? What what do you what what do you have your your sights set on at this point in your career? Career. Um, wait, as I, I'm probably the only one in my department that's of my age and not retired. There might be one more. <laughs> um, every time I jump and say I'm retiring, they say no, you're not. And um, so, in school now, it's like I don't want to be chair of anything. I'll help everyone. Mm. <laughs> Assign it. Um, I, I'm not going to go into obviously another career, mm. but I think each semester is like another career. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there has to be enough change and shift to make it feel that fresh and new. So, I mean, I could teach them class 45 times and it's not the same. Oh, no. No, as you were saying, not not if you're, I think, a solid and influential instructor. It's going to change every semester. We usually get together. We're going to start it again. And we would sketch on Friday. That's where some of the drawings that I gave you came from. Mm. And I have a good friend. Charles Klaubach introduced me to this school in the 70s, a Catholic girls' school called Mount Mary College. And they had a fabulous fashion design department. Microscope, oh. 20 students or 25 students. And I went out there for years and years and my friend Sandy was the chair. So I've known a lot of people because when I worked at Women's Work, I would do workshops in different schools in the summer. Oh, nice. So I know a lot of people from a lot of different schools. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's why I I don't want to think like the next part of my life because that gets too scary. I don't want to. <laughs> Number <laughs> scary. Okay. I hear um, you. You just move on. But do I want to retire now? So <laughs> what would you then say is the next um, transition or state of affairs for fashion illustration? Well, what's happening now is, see, when I went to school, we had fashion illustrators. And a designer didn't really have to, they had to do a little croaky or something. It didn't have to be fabulous. Mm-hmm. Now, the demands of a portfolio are so great. They're so great, mm-hmm. so competitive that, of course, you still need the design and all that background. Otherwise, you're not a designer. Um, the art level has gotten really high. Oh. Like, there are many of my students that easily, if there was fashion illustration as a profession, could do it tomorrow. Gosh. Many, not a lot, not three, but maybe this term 10. Amazing. Wow. So you're, you getting, you know, I love the fact that I could bring my background into this because some of it, I mean, I'm not saying it, you know, some of it, People don't know anymore because it goes back to techniques and rapidograph pens and bamboo stick. I mean, they don't know this. And mm-hmm. like, I like to introduce all this in the class. And I got a few of my students to do acrylic and paint instead of do watercolor. And one of them, I said, look at the difference in your work now, because there's a difference in drawing and there's drawing a difference in painting. And my work, goes more to the painting part too, but she says, I feel so comfortable when I work now. This is always a, like, so when you're saying the next part, it is the next part. Sure. And I think the last part is when I can't do it anymore, but I don't know. (laughs) Well, let me ask you, um, what have (laughs) I not 
asked you that you wish I had? Okay. <laughs> what have What have I left out of this conversation? Uh, I think we covered all the questions. Let me. What the normal question is. Um, what would you tell a student? I've got the word advice written down here. So yeah, let's let's go in that direction. Oh, I didn't see that one. No, I, I, I've written it by hand today. Okay, we because we have very long talks about this, especially when I teach exit portfolio and they're juniors. And I make them know that their work, you know, it's very different because let me explain. Because when you're teaching this level and you're working one-on-one -on -one with them constantly, mm. how could the work not be good? <laughs> right. So I try to tell them that no ego, no attitude. Um, the only attitude is in the figure that you draw. <laughs> oh, that's good. And I think, and I said, that should be all attitude. <laughs> okay. <And> Absolutely. <laughs> You also have to learn that not everyone is going to like your work. Right. Some people will really dislike it. Mm -hmm. And some people will be very nasty to you. And I tell them the story. And I said, get upset and get over it. <laughs> because they will be the ones that will be the right ones. And they're the ones. You know, I had a story when I got out of school. It was one of those days in one week where, you know, it was, on, I thought oh, I'll never work. I'm in a school in Montreal, it'll never be, it'll never be. And it was raining and I had an interview. It was like in the 30s, 38, 38 but on the street, dingy, dingy, bleak. Oh. And it was in a horrible building. It couldn't have been worse, okay? <laughs> and I opened the door and it's like so depressing. It was awful. Oh level of work they were doing but I think so as I'm getting in I tell the class but then I think okay it's all come down to this you know <laughs> the great drama this is all my dreams are shattered and I'm going to be working here oh. and this nasty woman who she looked like a witch I had to tell oh her. lord she came out and my portfolio was there she was eating a tuna fish sandwich it was in her hand. And I am going, if that man is drips on this portfolio, I'm going to... Okay. Right. And she goes, this is... So she's going like... Oh, no. And she goes, fashion uglies. I didn't even know what she was talking about. She said, all you people from your time. What? <laughs> and yeah, I'm like, I'm 19. Yeah. You draw these ugly faces and... And it's off. And she walks away. Two weeks later, I had, I don't know if I got depressed. I think I was happy she didn't hire me. <laughs> I had an interview at this agency called Trahey Wolf. It was Jane Trey, the biggest fashion agency, which I didn't know. Oh, gosh. So I'm going up and I meet this art director, young girl, young woman, and totally different the place was so gorgeous you could die <laughs> she's looking at the work and she goes this is really very beautiful and she's critiquing things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you approach this that was great yeah i maybe put you could have pulled this out a little bit more she said just wait a minute i want someone else to see it and this woman comes out i didn't know she was mm -hmm. and she's looking at my work and you know, she was older and very pulled together, like really pulled together. <laughs> She's saying, you know, your work reminds me of these, some of these artists whose work I love. And she said, you know, you did this very well, concentrate on that, maybe that was the end of that. And then she goes away and I said, who was that woman? It was Jane Trey. No. Whoa. It's do my first added bug. <sighs> So in two weeks, this is what I tell my class, you want to kill yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just, be, but I said, but you have to feel secure mm -hmm. that, I, and I tell them this at the beginning of the term, 
I tell them we're going to be working on an exit portfolio. Maybe I'll be difficult with you. I said, but it's not being difficult. I got to get it. I said, I got to get you all to the highest level you could be. Right. And I said, because the worst thing in the world is when you show your work to someone, you can't say, I wish I did. It has to be there. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so uh, true. And I tell them just, you know, if you want to get out of an internship nicely, tell them your teacher said your work is failing and you can't do both. And I said, think of me. I said, yeah. <laughs> school work. It can't affect your school work. Right. While you're in school. Um, mm -hmm. Or when you're in eighth semester, it's different. Okay, but not when you're in second. Right, right. But I, I wanted to make them feel secure and they could all mm -hmm. hold their own with anybody. And But they, they have to know that not everyone is going to like it. Right. No, that's a good lesson to learn early. And I make it clear. I said, you know, if you're a C student, and I don't have that many exactly, said, it's easier to like to, it's easier for more people to like your work. Mm -hmm. As you go up to A, because of the creativity level and everything else, it's and it not be that easy for a lot of people to even understand what you're doing. And I, and I ended, I said, it's like when you look at Instagram, I said, you know, or people with followers, I said, you have some of the worst Kardashian kind of people in the world with 27 billion followers. I said, McDonald's has 27 billion followers. Yeah. I said, now go to the finest, look at Pia Paolo, whatever, from Valentino. He doesn't have that many followers. I said, the higher level you go up, you're, you're not going to have those numbers. Well, right. Again, it's about being willing to take risks. Yeah, yeah. And, and being confident enough to know that that's okay. If you, if you fail, you fail, but there's another opportunity around the but corner. You have to fail. This mm -hmm. is, I tell mm -hmm. you, I want you to take a shot at something. And if yeah. it, it's good. Otherwise, you're going to just always be like that. Like, yeah. You know, but you got to do a drawing that you hate. <laughs> and one Eventually, of, yeah. Yeah. One of my students, Daniel Rosberry, who's the creative director at Scaparelli now. Yes. He was in art specialization and he did his portfolio. And then it was all done. And about two weeks before the show, he said, I want to redo it. So I said, go right ahead. You have one. I mean... And he redid the whole portfolio. So, and, oh my goodness. Yeah. But it's just very exciting because it's every class is a challenge and every student's a challenge. And Well, I just can't thank you enough for spending some time with me today and with our audience if they're lucky enough to. How do they get? Uh, how do yes, they we will. We will have this on our YouTube channel. Oh. Uh, affiliated with with this unit in the library and the library also has what they call archive on demand so it'll be in multiple places so what's the youtube um thing it's an address it's a uh yes actually um it's not uh it's just right there on our home page oh on the um, so what i'll do is when we publish the recording uh we'll get it transcribed and we'll include the um the address so if someone wants to hear it that's not here absolutely absolutely this is a great pleasure thank you thank you so much and i want to thank everybody who's paying attention and has been with us for the last hour and a half which has that's, just been amazing it was great so i hope you have a wonderful rest of the day yeah. thank you bye 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 bye